Good morning, church. If you're looking for the voice, it is way up high, but it's not that high. We are here today to celebrate believers' baptism. As Baptists, we practice what we believe is biblical baptism, which is something done by believers. This is why we don't baptize infants. We baptize those who have already come to faith in Jesus Christ. This is the public profession of faith. This is an opportunity for someone to say to the entire community of believers, I'm now one of you. I am a follower of Christ as well. I've got a brother and a sister in here with me today. I've got Kendall and Andrew uh, Glidewell, and they are here to bear witness to you that Jesus Christ has saved them because they have trusted him with their life both now and forevermore. Kendall, are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Yes. Then based on your testimony that Jesus is alive and lives in you, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, we're buried into his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Come step on that step right there. Andrew, are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Yes. Then based on your testimony that Jesus is alive and lives in you, it's my honor to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, we're buried into his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Howdy, Central. Would you open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 as we are moving our way through the book of Ecclesiastes. And we've got an eclipse coming tomorrow. And don't stare at it. If you stare at the sun, bad things happen. So I want you to be able to see the sun, so I drew you a picture. There we go. I actually did that for a reason, because I've been feeling like this picture all week. Using pencil and paper to try to illustrate and depict the radiance, the heat, and the brilliance of the sun is like trying to use this mouth to describe the brilliance and the radiance and the majesty of God. I have... I, you might have seen my Facebook post this morning. Oh, for a thousand tongues to preach. I don't have enough mouth, tongue, words, articulation, brain power to say to you what needs to be said today. So I'm asking you, you should do this every time. And if you don't, let this be the first time. Listen today, not just with your ears, but would you listen with your hearts? Listen prayerfully. This is too rich and too deep for me to articulate. We need the Holy Spirit to open our minds, to open our eyes, to open our hearts to what we need to see here today. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Difficult portion of Scripture, frankly. We're going to start in verse 13. I know your bulletin says verse 14, but verse 13 was our last verse last week, and it's really sort of a transition. It's where we make a little bit of a turn that, that ties these two sections together, but this is the glue that holds them together. So we'll start in verse 13 and go through verse 18. 713, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked. 
Neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this. And from that, withhold not your hand, for the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. So Solomon is talking about these injustices that we see. He's talking more about how unfair life is, and he's talking about how to deal with it. And he gives some really good advice, some really good principles that are timeless for us today, and I'm going to go through these. Now, you'll notice I never do this because I'm not creative enough, but the message today will be brought to you by the letter A. First is acceptance of things we don't understand. Acceptance of things we don't understand. That's what he's getting at in verse 13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Now, from last week, you might remember I talked about how crooked is not evil crooked. Crooked is convoluted, inscrutable. We can't understand. Isn't it true that you don't always get what God's up to? In fact, could I say it this way? Isn't it true that you hardly ever get what God's up to? God has these ways that are so mysterious and so complex because God is so mysterious and so complex and His mind is so much more complex than ours and He is working out all of these things. And what He's saying is don't try to oversimplify that, but instead we need to accept that when God is doing something, even though we don't see this straight, nice, neat line from point A to point B, that God has it all figured out. He even gives an example of something we don't understand. He talks again about injustice in verse 15. Solomon says, in my vain life, I've seen everything. There's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life and is able to do it. In other words, I see righteous people who get all the bad stuff and they die early, and I see wicked people living it up and everything goes great and they live to be 100. What is going on with that? This boils down to things just aren't fair. The absolute single worst thing I can imagine is losing a child. Some of you have experienced that. I'm so sorry. It's backwards, isn't it? We're not supposed to bury our children. It's supposed to be the other way around. And it just seems so unfair, so unjust, especially when it's little children who are innocent, who have never committed a sin in their lives. Why? Why is this happening? Thomas Boston had 10 children. Six of them died. Can you imagine going to six funerals for your children? One of his children, one of his sons was named Ebenezer. Ebenezer comes, it's a phrase in Scripture. Ebenezer means um, stone of help. When the Israelites, through supernatural intervention from God, defeated the Philistines who had captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they won back the Ark of the Covenant. They erected the stone to remind them of that day, and they called it the Stone of Help, the Ebenezer, and he lost his Stone of Help, and his next child born was a son, and the minister said, what are you going to name him? And he says, Ebenezer. Everyone around him said, don't do it. This one might not make it either, and he did it anyway. And the boy died. Thomas Boston was a Scottish theologian who died in 1732 at the age of 56. He wrote a sermon on Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 13. The title of his sermon was The Crooked Lot, The Sovereignty and Wisdom of God in the Afflictions of Men displayed. It was actually republished just this year with a new, more contemporary title called The Crook in the Lot, What to Do When Our Lot in Life is Not Health, Wealth, and Happiness. This man who suffered so greatly and out of the outflow of his heart, meditating on Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 13 says this, everybody's lot in this world has some crook in it. 
There is no perfection here. No lot out of heaven without a crook. So what do we do? How many times as a pastor have I sat with people who have said to me, Pastor, why? For various tragedies. And how many times have I felt so inadequate as a pastor when I repeated the exact same answer every time? Three words. You know the answer, don't you? I don't know. We accept that God is still good. That God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are, a call, and are called according to His purpose. When the second Ebenezer died, Boston wrote in his memoirs, it pleased the Lord that He also was removed from me. He didn't understand, but what he accepted is that he couldn't understand. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to do. I hope you never hear me preaching as though I think I'm telling you stuff that's just easy. Oh, yeah, just get on with it. No, 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 no. It's hard to do. We're going to talk about how to get to that place where we, can, where we can accept that, where we can still worship God, where we can move on. But, of course, we think sometimes that if we were God, the world would be so much better, don't we? We accuse God of injustice. We accuse God of doing wrong. And the implication is, well, if I were God, I would have done better than God. Y'all remember the movie, Bruce Almighty? Terrible, terrible theology, but a really good point. This guy's mad at God because of all the bad stuff in his life, so God shows up. Morgan Freeman plays God. By the way, I keep asking the sound guys to make me sound like Morgan Freeman, (laughs) and they will not do it. I don't know why. You would appreciate it, I'm sure. But God shows up to Jim Carrey, Bruce says, okay, I'm going to let you be God for a while. And he makes a mess of everything, doesn't he? And isn't it true that if you were God, you'd make a mess of everything? You know how I know you'd make a mess of everything? Because you'd probably make almost as big a mess as I would. We don't know the things God knows. We don't understand the things God understands. So we have to come to a place of acceptance of things we don't understand. The second thing that Solomon tells us is that we need to have an appreciation for the good things. Verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. You ever know people who are always finding a dark cloud in every silver lining? Life is great, but they complain about it. I heard a comedian one time talking about how life is great and nobody's happy. We have our cell phones today, right? We have our cell phones. And what do we do? It wasn't that long ago we didn't own cell phones. And what do we do? Ugh, can't get a signal. I hate Verizon. Ugh. Can you give it a second? Move a few feet? Go outside? It's not that big a deal. We're traveling from coast to coast on an airplane. Oh, flight was delayed 45 minutes. It was awful. This guy talks about, you remember how people used to get from one end of the country to the other? Wagon train, children were born, people died, they fought the Native Americans. It was deadly and perilous, and by the time they got there, it was a whole different group of people than what left. And now we get on an airplane, and we fly for five hours from New York to Los Angeles, and oh, it was awful. (laughs) Solomon has a word for us spoiled first world people. When things are good, enjoy them. Enjoy the good things. And don't forget that on the bad days, those days come from God also. That's what he says, in the days of prosperity be joyful, in the days of adversity consider God has made the one as well as the other. You remember when Job lost all his children, his grandchildren, his livelihood, and his health, the only person God left him with was his sweet wife who saw him sitting there covered in sores, grieving, 
And what was the, the lovely, godly Proverbs 31 advice she gives him? Why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> and he says to her, and I wonder if she slapped him. <laughs> you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Are, are we so arrogant, in other words, to think that all we deserve is good, good, good. It needs to be ice cream and puppies and butterflies every day. Why would we curse God just because things don't go our way. We don't like the bad, no. But let me ask you this. Could it be that adversity serves a purpose? Could it be, for example, that adversity serves to remind us that joy is not to be found in the things under the sun, that joy is only to be found in the one who is over the sun? Parents, do you always give your kids everything they want? Do you strive to make their lives as easy and comfortable as possible? Or are you a mean parent? You take things away. You make them do stuff they don't want to do. You occasionally inflict a little bit of pain on a certain padded portion of the little bodies. And they don't understand why you're doing it. But you do. Well, if we are that way, why should we expect less from God? Have you ever heard this saying? I know you have. God will not give you more than you can handle. You know where that came from? Let me tell you where it did not come from. The Bible. The Bible teaches the exact opposite of that. Next time somebody says, God won't give you more than you can handle. You can just tell them, false. He will give us more than we can handle. He will not give us more than he can handle. Listen, the apostle Paul is one of the greatest giants of the faith, and God gave him more than he could handle. Listen to this from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and following. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now, let's not go past that too fast. The affliction that we experienced in Asia. Oh, what, a, what kind of affliction did he have? Well, he was thrown in jail. He was beaten. He was stoned and left for dead. He was tortured, abused, maligned. He says, hey, we don't want you to be unaware informed about that, we were so, listen to this, so utterly burdened, listen, beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I think we get these images. Here's the Apostle Paul and these other guys going, oh yes, I'm being stoned, but I'm so pious. No, he was utterly overwhelmed, despairing of life. He says, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But, I love that word in Scripture, but that was to make us, that was to make us, in other words, all these afflictions had a purpose. That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You're about to die, you better trust the one who can raise the dead. On him, he says, on him we have set our hope. What is the good? What is the good? I don't know. In your situation, I don't know. But when it's good, let's appreciate the good and praise God. The next reaction characteristic is actually a caution, and that's the avoidance of extreme reactions. Verse 16 and 17. This is cool. This is really cool. Watch this. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Verse 17, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Now, this means don't be too good or too bad. Just be kind of good and kind of bad. Find that middle of the road. Yeah, do a little bad stuff, do a little good stuff. Just kind of find that middle of the road. That kind of describes the church in America today. We're going to be kind of good, kind of bad. You know, we don't want to be real religious. That's not what this is getting at. Some people think so. I'll never forget 
my very, the, the very first church I pastored, there was a guy who became a Christian who was literally, when I say this, I'm not using this as a derogatory term, he was into paganism. He worshiped ancestors and spirits and did sacrifices and all this kind of stuff. And he became a Christian. And immediately, I mean, he became a Christian on a Monday night. I remember it in his living room. And Tuesday morning, he went to work and shared the gospel with every single person he knew. He led his 86-year-old grandma to Jesus. He started telling everyone he could about Jesus. And get this, he got frustrated that every Christian wasn't doing that. He didn't understand. He's like, how? he would say in church, he'd go, how can you people know what you know and not tell people? So a bunch of very helpful, older, mature Christians pulled him aside one day. They said, hey, buddy, you need to dial it back. And you don't need to worry because in a few years you'll be just like us. He came to me and he said, is that true? I said, brother, I pray to God it is not true. Is that what this is getting at? Don't be so into Jesus. No. It's talking about an excessive piety, an overly pious, an overt, too, too phony, if you will, of a religion, of a righteousness, an excessive piety grounded in self-righteousness. In other words, we might look at the injustice in the world and say, well, I'm going to beat that by being extra holy. Just watch me. You know what happens when you do that? You become arrogant and judgmental, and everyone else around you is less holy than you are. Do you know that's actually the opposite of trusting God? That's trusting self. So he says, don't get so full of yourself and think you know so much that you don't need to rely on God anymore. And the other extreme is overtly walking away from the face, looking at evil, experiencing adversity. You look at the injustice in the world. You say, I've been doing everything right. All these bad people are getting better stuff than I'm getting. That's it. I'm done. I've had it. What's the point? Both of those reactions are, in effect, a turning away from God to self. One is a turning away from God to your own religion, and one is a turning away from God into dissipation. But make no mistake, both of those are a rebellion against God. But Solomon gives us the answer, and this is where it comes to a head. This is where where I need a thousand tongues. We need to have awe for the one true God. How do you keep from the extremes? How do you keep from becoming so full of yourself, taking matters into your own hands, and becoming a religious jerk? How do you keep from throwing in the towel, abandoning your faith, walking away, and still, out out of all this, how do you deal with the unfairness, the injustice In the adversity in life, Solomon says the answer is to fear God. We see this over and over. To fear God is more than being afraid of God. So there is that element in there. I think we need a little more of that today. It's more than just revering and respecting God, though that is definitely part of it. But I want to share with you just a great psalm that addresses this, Psalm 73. Psalm 73 was written by a guy named Asaph, who was appointed by David to lead the worship in the temple. Listen to what Asaph said. I'm just going to read parts of this psalm to you. This is fascinating to me. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Listen to what he says. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. In other words, he says, I almost stumbled away. I almost fell, spiritually speaking. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, I see all these good people getting bad stuff, and I see all the bad people getting good stuff, and I almost slipped. He says, they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. 
Behold, these are the wicked always at ease. They increase in riches. And he says this, all in vain. I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. And all the day long, I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He says, but when I thought, how to understand this? He's trying to figure out the crooked ways here. He says, I thought, how to understand this? It seemed to me a wearisome task until, this is the payoff here, you guys, until I went into the sanctuary of God. I almost stumbled until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then he gets a right perspective. He says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Whom am I in heaven but you? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh, my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful to you, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. How did Asaph keep from stumbling? He did it by entering into the presence of God and worshiping Him. He stopped looking at the wicked. He stopped looking at the circumstances, and he turned his eyes upward. How many of you have seen the movie Dunkirk? Have any of you seen the movie? I highly recommend it. It's tough to watch. It's a brutal war movie. tells a true story. The thing is, it doesn't tell the back story. It leaves a lot out. And I wonder how many of you know the story of Dunkirk. 380,000 British, French, and Belgian troops trapped near Dunkirk on the northern coast of France. 380,000. The Nazis have them hemmed in. They're literally between the water and the Nazis, between a rock and a wet place. They're stuck. They send word back home. We're stuck. Help us. Word comes back. No help coming. Imagine, no help coming. So they sent a three-word communique back to Britain. Three words. But, if, not. But, if, not. Now, back then, people knew their Bibles well enough to recognize that. Three guys. Israelites living in captivity in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar sets up a golden statue, says everybody has to bow before that statue and worship. These three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't do it. They didn't make an issue of it. They just wouldn't do it. Somebody turned them in. King called them in, says you need to bow. If you don't bow, you get thrown into the furnace. Their response You can throw us into the furnace, king. And our God is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us, but if not, we will not bow before the idols. But if not, we will not bow. Let me ask you this question. What is it? What is, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar had the furnace heated to 10 times its original normal heat, so hot that the people that took them to throw them into the furnace died. Tell me what it is that three guys, three guys, you, let's huddle together, guys. Let's think about this. Let's just bend before the statue, go away. Ask God to forgive us. He's a kind and gracious God. He will forgive us. It's the wrong thing to do, but let's do it. But that furnace is hot. What is it? What is it that causes three guys to see two options? Bending the knee for a second is one option. Burning alive is the other. And they see this as the more desirable option. What is it that causes their buddy Daniel to have a similar option? Option one, bend the knee and worship for just a second. 
or get fed to a bunch of hungry lions, looking down at the lions and saying, I'll take that option. What is it that causes a guy like Paul to be willing to be stoned and tortured and imprisoned when all he has to do is renounce Christ? All he has to do is deny the faith. What is it that helps people today all around the world who are dying and suffering and being in prison when all they have to do is walk away quietly? Why is torture and pain and agony and death a better option than a life of ease and comfort? You say, well, those guys are just awesome. That's what, that's what we do. Be a Daniel. Be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Be like Paul. No. Those guys aren't awesome. Those guys have an awesome God. Those guys so knew God and His majesty and His brilliance and His greatness and His glory and His compassion and His kindness and His love and His mercy that the thought of just a second, just a second, just a second on a knee before a false god was more abhorrent to them than being burned alive, being eaten by lions, being stoned to death, being thrown into prison, anything that could come at them. God is too great, too glorious, too good. For that, they had their eyes in the right place. This is our takeaway. Here is how we survive injustice, suffering, and adversity. We have to attain a God entranced vision of all things. Stole that phrase, by the way, from John Piper. A God entranced vision of all things is the phrase that John Piper uses describing the life of Jonathan Ed- Edwards. It means having a mind so saturated so saturated with the vision of the splendor, the majesty, the glory, the greatness, the grace and mercy and love of God that everything else has the right perspective. And you're saying, yeah, but how do I do that? Thanks for asking. Rather quickly, I want to tell you five things we need to do to attain a God and trans vision of all things. Number one, Honestly confess your weakness and need of divine help. It starts with saying, God, I, I look at the wrong stuff. I get discouraged. I feel defeated. I want to throw in the towel, and I can't help it. Help me. That's where it all starts. It all starts not with saying, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better starting today. No. The gospel is not about doing better. The gospel is about receiving something. Secondly, resolutely deal with those things that compete with God for supremacy in your heart. Resolutely deal with those things that compete with God for supremacy in your heart. What in your life consumes you most? Is it your possessions, social media, career, hobbies, kids, activities? What's your greatest distraction? Let me put it this way. What excuses do you use not to pray? What excuses do you use not to read the Bible? What excuses do you use not to get more involved in church, not to serve in church, not to do the things you know you're supposed to because, well, you've got this and you've got that and all this and all these things over here and all that kind of stuff. You need to, you need to deal with those things, and you need to deal with them right now because what's happened is those things have become more supreme to you than God is. Those things are sitting on the throne of your heart where God belongs, And you need to not play around. Thirdly, diligently immerse your mind in the Word of God. Now, here's the thing. I say immerse your mind in the Word of God. If you want a God and transvision of all things, what do you do? You go to how God revealed Himself. You see, this is what the Bible is. The Bible is God's revelation of Himself. We We don't treat it like that sometimes. I've been reading articles the last few weeks 
about where a solar eclipse in the United States of America fits in to the Bible. I had more hair. I pulled some out. It's driving me crazy. Why do you read it? I don't know why I read it. Reading the Bible to align, try to align current events is like reading a newspaper to learn calculus. It's like reading a cookbook to learn the history of Rome. That's not what those books are for, and that's not what the Bible is for. The Bible is to show us who God is. You can't know God apart from Scripture. You say, well, I don't, and this is legitimate, by the way. You see, Mike, I just, I tried to read the Bible. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. That's why you come here. We help you with that, okay? First off, go to Sunday school. Seriously, go to Sunday school. What are you reading in Sunday school? Well, study that throughout the week. That's a great place to start. You know another great place to start? Open the Bible and read it. Read it anywhere. You say, well, I've tried reading it, and I get bogged down. Did you start in Genesis? Listen, I love Genesis, but if you're not used to reading the Bible and you start in Genesis chapter 1, you're going to get to Genesis chapter 5 and give up. Because Genesis chapter 5, this person begat this person who lived this long and then begat this person, and it's a chapter of that. And it's actually good, but it seems really boring. Go to one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I would encourage you, don't just start at page 1 and don't start at Revelation. I'm preaching through Ecclesiastes. Study Ecclesiastes. Just read something. You know what? If you're not reading any Bible and you read some Bible, that's an improvement. Somebody asked me the other day, well, how much time do I need to spend reading the Bible? Some. The Bible doesn't tell us how much time, but you need to immerse it. You need to read it enough that it's shaping the way that you're thinking. Fourthly, passionately engage with the people of God. Church life can't be only when it's convenient for you. It's like Asaph. I almost stumbled until I showed up to worship. He got with the people of God to worship God. And everything came into perspective. Are you engaged? When you come for worship, are you engaged in worship? Are you involved in the Bible studies that we offer? Are you taking full advantage of what we're trying to to, to give you here? Are you involved in kingdom service through the church? The community of faith is a wonderful corrective for bad thinking, and it's a wonderful aid to right living. And then fifth, relentlessly pursue joy in Christ alone. What do you think will make you happy? If you're trying to find happiness, joy in anything but Jesus, you will keep seeking and you'll never find. George Mueller was brought up in our Sunday school lesson today. George Mueller lived a long time ago, and he is known to be a man of prayer. Remarkable story. I I suggest reading a biography on George Mueller. But I want to read something to you that George Mueller said. He says, I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord, how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man may be nourished. By the way, the way he did that is he got up every day and he spent time with the Word and in prayer. He stayed there until his soul was aflame with joy in Christ. Stop dabbling with your Christianity and go all in. I think we have seen today that I cannot adequately draw the sun with a pencil. And I cannot adequately tell you about the God we worship. I cannot adequately tell you about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of Daniel, the God of Moses, the God of Isaiah, the God of Paul, the God of Peter. I just feel so weak and ineffectual. But here's what I can tell you. 
that God's glory has never been more fully on display than at the cross of Jesus. For it was at the cross where both the anger of God and the compassion of God met. The beauty of God and the terror of God converged. Because Scripture teaches that every single one of us has rebelled against the king of the universe and that he's mad. Wait, I don't like talking about God being mad. Then don't read the Bible. He's mad. But here's what happened. He loves you enough that he gave up his own son to be our substitute. And it was his will foreordained for him to be murdered on the cross. And when he was on the cross, not only was he suffering physically, but God took all the stored up wrath for all the sins previously committed and for the sins you and I were going to commit. And he took all the anger, all the wrath, all the punishment, and he unleashed the fury of hell on his son. So that Jesus paid it all. That is glory and beauty and wonder. And when you look at Jesus, you're seeing the God who was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're seeing the God that shut the lion's mouth. You're seeing the God that sprung Paul and his companions from prison. And you're seeing the God who stood by when, when Paul was beheaded and ushered him into glory forever. I wish I could tell you about him. I wish I could describe him to you. Because when we get this in our heads, friends, when we get this in our hearts, everything else starts to fall into place so that we say, my flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's pray.